church. May we stay stand for the call to worship. I'll be reading from Psalms 100, verse 1 through verse 5. Again, that's Psalms 100, verse 1 through verse 5. And it reads, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before its presence with singing. Come before its presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us. It is he that hath made us. And not we ourselves. And not we ourselves. We are his people. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. And the sheep of his pasture. Enter to his gates with thanksgiving. Enter to his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name. And bless his name. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. And the truth endureth to all generations. And the truth endureth to all generations. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. And the truth endureth to all generations. And the truth endureth to all generations. Let's pray. Amen. But dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, Heavenly Father, come thank you for this day, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, I come thank you for this collective worship, Heavenly Father, for us, all of us being here, Heavenly Father. And we mostly thank you for your son who came down and died, Heavenly Father, that we have right to a true life, Heavenly Father. And may we take what we learned today, Heavenly Father, and apply it to our lives, Heavenly Father, where we become better Christians in the future than we've been in the past, dear Lord. We bless you, truly grateful for and all the blessings bestowed upon us, dear Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Let's turn our hymn books to 348. 348. It will be 348. He'll talk for glory. All have it, let's sing. Onward rejoicing, our chair lies way.
Oh, 
chapter verses one through one through three. And those say, well, I need to stand, please, for the word. <coughs> now is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, envy, and all evil speaking. As newborn babes desire pure milk of the word, you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I read 1 Peter, 2nd chapter, verses 1 through 3. 
And now we have a prayer for it. Dear Heavenly Father, bless the sick, the afflicted, as well as those that care for them. Bless the homeless, the hungry, and pour out a special blessing to those who are bereaved. Bless this congregation and the community in which we work, dwell, live, and serve. We bless our manservant, Brother Gino, and continue to crown his head with your word while impairing knowledge and wisdom as he brings the message for our edification. Let us fill and enrich our hearts, minds, and soul, and spirit as we may do these things that are pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask all these things in the precious, holy, and mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And let the church say, Amen. 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 Let's turn on Hilda's page 19, our favorite song for him. Bring book before the speaker comes. I'm just a hard-fighting soldier and I'm on the battlefield.
Well, we, we, we've been going through a series of lessons that helps us to understand, you know, the grace of God, the goodness of God, as uh, it relates to our divine salvation. The body of Christ, we are, we are God's uh, redeemed people. Yes. We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We've been saved, sanctified, and set apart for God's holy and divine purposes. Not for our own purposes, but for His holy and divine purposes. And as we come to grips with that, uh, we, we've already uh, we've gone through uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, we introduce as a series the divine salvation. And in that divine salvation, we saw um, uh, this salvation brings a hope. It brings us heaven. We said that this divine salvation, it perfects uh, our faith through trials. God uses trials to uh, mature us, to, to, to perfect us. And even uh, this divine salvation holds the interest of prophets and angels. We said that the, the prophets, prophets search diligently to find out, you know, what seed and you know, the spirit of Christ which was in them did speak. That even the angels denied, denied to look upon the things that we now receive freely through the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then it, it, it encourages imitation. No, we don't necessarily want to be like Mike. We want to be like Christ. Yes, right. And therefore, if you understand Jesus is our model and our example. I want to be like him. We said if you are in the family of God, you ought to want to bear the family resemblance. You ought to want to look like a Christian. You want to act like a Christian. Everything about you should say Jesus. And then it talks about uh, we have been redeemed at infinite cost. In as much as you were not purchased about some trivial stuff like silver and gold. Those things that the fleshly nature craves. No, but the precious blood of Jesus is what has purchased us. Ah, uh, and because of that, uh, this divine salvation causes us, it gives birth to brotherly love. Hey. You're in the family of God, you are I love your siblings. That's right. Your spiritual siblings. <laughs> is that all right? Mm -hmm. And so therefore, Peter, yes, sir. as he goes through this first section, talking about this divine salvation, uh, he now pivots and he begins uh, a statement that helps to generate uh, this new uh, theme that we're going to embrace for the next several weeks. And that is, now that we have been uh, saved by this divine uh, prerogative of God, we call it grace, uh -huh. his right. divine initiative. Right. Now that we are there, uh, we must now live a life that is affected by the word. Living a life affected by the word. The word of God ought to have some kind of impact on your life. That's right. It ought to bring about some kind of change in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's, it's an oxymoron to be a Christian but not be changed. Yeah. Right. Uh, and it, it, it does not really measure up to everything that God and his word talks about if we are become members of the church of Christ and are the same. And even when you are born again, yeah. Come on. Come on. <laughs> not a corruptible, but an incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. If you've been born again, now there is another phase yes. uh, that we talk about. Not only do we embrace salvation, but we must also move towards sanctification. That's right. In other words, we need to continue to grow, uh, can continue uh, to pursue uh, the high calling of God. That's right. Yes, sir. Preach. I want to say that now that you are saved, what are you going to do about it? I, I want to say that just as salvation is the work of God, sanctification involves our willingness to become conformed by the word into the image of Jesus. Amen. Do I need to say that again? I think we need to understand that uh, just as you are, are saved, and that is a work of God, you can't save yourself. That God's holy and divine initiative. He, that's what we call it, grace. Right. You can't marry with this one. Right. You know, you can, you can do a lot of brown nosing on your job and, and all that, you know, political wrangling and jockeying and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to salvation, uh -huh. 
That's what God does. That's right. And we simply submit to what he's doing to his divine initiative. All the sanctification. Yes, you've been set apart, but there is a process of maturity that we must go through in order to be fully functional and devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Right. Now let that sink in a minute. You don't just necessarily become a Christian and all of a sudden you're superhuman. <laughs> you're impervious. You're impervious to sin. Uh, no, no. We, we still have to deal with the, the habits that hinder our maturity. Those habits uh, that uh, we'll, uh, we call it the old man. The low thoughts. The low cravings. The low, you know, way of doing things. That, that worldly, you know, perspective yeah. that lends itself to carnal living. You know, we, 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 uh, let me put that up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's all right, come on. <laughs> let me, let me, let me say this. Take your time. Let, let me say this. This sanctification involves, again, our willingness to be conformed mm -hmm. to the word. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, by the word. See, the word uh, is that... <clears throat> That transforming agent. You see, scriptures is what the Bible calls God breathed. It comes from God. And, and, and it, is, it is profitable for us. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But suffice to say, right now, if you want to become conformed to the image of Christ, you must digest the word of God. Right? Well, the objective of this message is simply this. Uh, to be saved and productive. To be saved and productive. The devil don't care a whole lot about you being just saved if you're not productive. See, you can you can become a member of the church and raise all kind of hell in the church. You can be a member of the church and be you know impotent in the church. Be 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 laid back. Uh, in the church and, and not striving to become what God wants you to become. In other words, you say, I'm not going to glorify God. I'm just going to rap, rattle in my own, you know, and bask in the sun of my own salvation. Oh, boy. Well, that's you know, good to be saved. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, but now that you're saved, what are you going to do about it? What is God calling you to do? <laughs> How are you affecting or impacting the salvation of others? <clears throat> And so I want to say uh, there is a practical side of this that begins to come out in chapter 2. Uh, to be productive uh, is a manifestation of a proper love for him who loved us. Amen. Now I'm going to get down to where the rubber really needs to roll on this thing. So I'm, I may lose some of you, but I'm trying to circle around to the time to pick up those strays, right? In other words, uh, we must be affected by the word before we can be effective in administering the word. I, for some reason, it feels like I gotta say that again. We must be affected before we can be effective. Now, I, I want to just set the stage a little while in a little bit. While in chapter 1, it emphasizes the importance of being born into the family of God, right? Mm -hmm. We've already talked about that. But chapter 2 stresses the necessity of growth resulting from that new birth. See, if you've been born again, see, that new birth triggers something else. See, when a, a, a baby is born, they are fighting for life. Right. They want to live. And so, uh, just as the child of God, as we are born into the family of God, we ought to want to live. In other words, that means to thrive, right. to grow, right. yes, and survive. Right. Okay. See, sometimes we're all in survival mode, but we never take time to really want to thrive. Mm -hmm. God wants us to not only survive, but he wants us to thrive, mm -hmm. yes, in this world. He wants us to be productive mm -hmm. and effective mm -hmm. in this world. 
And so I want to give this to you today. As we look at this passage, there's only three sharp little <coughs> verses. Really, there's only one sentence. And this sentence uh, really brings in these three verses. He said, wherefore? He said, laying aside all uh, malice and all God and hypocrisy and envy and all evil speaking. He said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world. Mm -hmm. Why? That ye may grow thereby. If so, ye have tasted uh, that the Lord is gracious. Mm -hmm. We're going to bite those, we're gonna, you know, take a couple of bites at this thing, right? Because the first, in verse 1, we see the, the preparation for spiritual maturity. See, God wants us to mature, so therefore there must be some preparation. We just can't just jump in there and just, you know, accidentally mature. No. God has, uh, that's why we have his word. He gives the people, there's, there's preparation that must be taken in order to be a fully functional and devoted follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not a haphazard kind of thing. It's not based on how long you sit on people. It's not based on how many Bible studies you go to. It, see, James would say, don't be simply a hearer of the word. Mm -hmm. He said, you must be one who practices the word. He said, be a doer of the word. Mm -hmm. Don't be that one who looks in the mirror and sees his reflection and then turns around and forget exactly what he looks like. Mm -hmm. And so it's through the exercise of spiritual disciplines that we mature. Now watch this. Again, the preparation for spiritual maturity. Now let's circle back around and look at that verse again. He said, uh, wherefore? Now we've already set the stage. Because in this text we see he's just following the natural progression from chapter 1. If God has been so good and God has done all these things for us, now uh, it, it, it's incumbent upon us to respond in the proper way. He said, notice, he said, wherefore? Uh, based on what God has done for your life. Has God been good for you? Mm -hmm. Has he been good to you? Amen. Is he working in your life? Yes. He said, now, uh, so, now he says, we understand that. He says, I will change the word word forward to the word so. He says, so, now let's get down to business. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. He said, we understand that God is good, so, or uh, wherefore, let's talk about it our proper response to God. Mm -hmm. Okay? Notice, he says, uh, he, he deals with what I call the active and uh, preventative measures toward Christian growth. The active and then preventative measures toward Christian growth. In other words, he begins to first talk from the negative. Mm -hmm. He said, I want you to do something. He says, lay aside all malice. In other words, he's coming from the negative perspective. So I'm saying you need to get rid of it. Okay? Cease and desist. He said, lay aside all malice. Right? He said, lay aside several things that hinder your spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. See, our deep love for God stems from his great demonstration of love for us. Mm -hmm. Number one. Okay? You didn't just wake up loving God. No, you're responding to God's love for you. Why is that when you were, you know, enemies? Okay? When you were sinners. Thank you, brother. When we were uh, shaking a fist of rebellion against God. Jesus died for us. That's right. That's a demonstration of love. Mm -hmm. And so now we are responding to what God has done. We are appreciating what God is doing. We are looking with great anticipation what God promises that he will do in your life if you will submit to his will. That's right. Come on. Notice the word if. That's right. Come on. Amen. I thank God for today. Amen. You see, our regard for God is seen through our regard for his word. Okay? Put your seatbelt on. I don't want to turn the corner. I don't want to lose your life. <laughs> see, our regard for the word reveals our regard for God. So we can't come in here talking about, oh, how I love Jesus and don't have any regard for the word of God. We need to make the word of God a, a centerpiece in our heart. I didn't say the centerpiece on your coffee table. 
I didn't say that thing that, you know, that Bible that is in the back seat of your car and when you move it, you can see where the sun is it's changing the color mm. of your mm. interior. Mm. <laughs> Centipede in your heart. Mm -hmm. In other words, we ought to meditate on the day and night. Mm. How many of us have a Bible reading schedule? How many of us are actually practicing the discipline of reading the Word of God every day? Mm -hmm. and, and that becomes, you know, the beginning of this question, not the end. Because we can't just read it and say, well, I read the word of God. No, 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 no. That's just a beginning. Not right there. You have to start somewhere, right? So therefore, you have a regard for the word because you have a regard for the one who is the author of the word. That's right. Our, our regard for God is now seen through our regard for his word. And uh, the very word that brought you salvation is the very word that is going to produce spiritual maturation mm -hmm. in your life. Yes. If that word again, why does word keep coming up? If we adhere to it, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus would say, uh, "He who hears uh, these words of mine, he says them mine." I would like him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. That's right. <coughs> and so notice, as we look at this active and preventative measures toward Christian growth, it, it takes a a decisive uh, negative act to get us to holiness. He says, so put away. There's some things right now in your life that you need to put away. Amen, right, right, right. We've been holding on to stuff that we need to just let it go. Put it away. Make it a, 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 a definitive, uh, a decisive uh, determination in my heart that there are certain things that I'm going to put away. Mm -hmm. And don't just uh, decide uh, to put it away. Right. Follow through on your decision. Right. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Uh, someone said there was, there, were, there, were, there were two frogs on this lily pad. <coughs> and one decided to jump. Oh. And how many were there after that? <clears throat> so I was like, one. He said, no, nah, there was two. He decided, but he didn't act on the decision yet. <laughs> you got to act on your decision. When you went into the water and grave of baptism, you know, trusting God to wash away your sin, you also made a commitment and a promise to God that I'm going to act. I'm going to respond. I'm going to now walk in the newness of life as a and an everyday thing. I'm now walking in the heavenly sunlight. I'm now walking in the newness of life. That is a lifelong pursuit of holiness. The word, uh, he says, put away, which simply means to, to strip off, uh, to, to get rid of something in my life. That's right. It's kind of like you have on an old garment, uh -huh. an old suit of clothing, uh -huh. and you've been working out, uh -huh. and you've been sweating, and you've been doing all this stuff, and yeah. spilling stuff all over it, and, and you know, whatever. You, now it's time for you to strip that stuff off. That's right. And now put on some new clothes. Some new garments. The garments of righteousness. So he said, in order for you to effectively wear this garment of righteousness, there are some things that need to be taken off first. Put away first. And he says, let's strip off of the old and defiled garment for the new garment. The old wrapping, we call the old man. The negative habits. See, this one, this one trips us up. <clears throat> so we make some decisions, we want to do some good stuff, but we still have those old habits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes habits are hard to break. Mm -hmm. Somebody said a habit <clears throat> is like a feather. Mm -hmm. When it's formed, it's so light you don't even notice it. Mm -hmm. Until it grows, it becomes yeah. such a heavy chain that you can't break it. Mm -hmm. You got some habits that are shaping us. Mm -hmm. And these habits are uh, preventing us mm -hmm. from growing into the image of Jesus. Mm -hmm. now, now, notice this. As we talk about these wrappings that we must make a decision to get rid of, uh, the Apostle Peter gives three categories here. He gives three categories as he begins to uh, number <clears throat> these things that must be put away. Okay? Mm -hmm. Notice uh, these Three categories, but when we count, we find five. We find five sins, but there are three categories. 
Notice the word all. The word all helps us to see uh, the different categories of sin that must be purged from our heart. And in other words, he says all, meaning all kinds of that particular sin. Now let's read the text. It says, laying aside all malice. In other words, all kinds of malice. See, malice can show up in a lot of different ways. Malice can, can, can show up, you know, when you don't even recognize that's what it is. But when you look at it with a closer examination, we find, we find these five marks of immaturity that they will curtail and stifle our spiritual growth. So therefore, when he says, put on all sorts of malice, he says, there is a spirit of ill will floating around out there. Sometimes we have ill will towards another. Yeah. And, and that ill will uh, produces a desire to get even with somebody. Mm -hmm. You feel someone has wronged you, real or perceived. You feel that someone has you know, wronged you, and you develop this, this contempt for them, and this ill will for them. And in the subconscious mind, you want to get even with them. And you may not do anything to get even, but when somebody mentions their name, your reaction assassinates them. Yeah, I know where I'm going with this. Sometimes we have this malice and this ill will, all kinds of, uh, it manifests itself in all kinds of ways. He said, put that stuff away. That ill will toward others. Do you not know that Christ died for them just like Jesus died for you? He said, put it away. He said, in all sorts of guile. But notice when he uses the word guile, all sorts of guile, he uses it as deceitfulness, right? But it manifests itself in hypocrisy and in envy, which is a kissing cousin of jealousy. Right? So he says, uh, all sorts of guile. You know, some people are just straight out liars. Every once in a while, you get caught up, you may say a little, little lies and not, you know, little untruths. <laughs> we need so many euphemisms, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I spoke of untruths. I misrepresented the fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you lie. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you see, there's one, there, there are people who are liars. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And when I say liars, you know, you can't trust the word they say. Mm -hmm. Now you got that right. Mm -hmm. You got that right, bro. <clears throat> Some people will lie to your face uh -huh. and then talk to somebody else and tell them a lie while you're there and want you to get a close after they lie. Mm. <laughs> 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 yeah, we call it the Pinocchio theory. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But let's get back to the point. He said, all God is that deceitfulness. Uh, and all hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is, is pretense. It, it, it's pretense. It's that whole idea of wanting to be what you are not. They use this uh, in old times when they would have those plays. They would have one who would have a false face and a smile. Mm -hmm. And then the same person would be playing different parts. And then he would put on put another mask up, would have a frown. Mm -hmm. And another uh, mask that would depict something else. Mm -hmm. He was a play actor. He was a hypocrite. Yeah, hypocrite. And sometimes we got the hypocrites running around in the church. Oh, we can make sure, we, can, we, we work from pretend. We want people to perceive us as one way, but really we are another way. Mm -hmm. He said, be real. He said, come legit or quick. That's what, that's what my Bible says. You know what your Bible say? He said, <laughs> be legit or quick. Yeah. In other words, uh, put away all of these uh, behaviors uh, that stifle your ability to mature in Christ. Mm -hmm. As long as you are one with malice, as long as you are one with all God and hypocrisy and envy, do you not know that stifles your Christian maturity? You can't get past that. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, these things are holding you back. This pretense, claiming to be something that you're not. Uh, this envy, uh, which is an unwarranted desire for what someone else has. Uh -huh. 
I mean, sometimes I can get jealous. I, I'm, I'm mad at you because you got this, and I, I want what you got. Sometimes I don't even want what you got. I'm just mad because you got it. Here they go again. They think they all have it. Brother, get a nice ride, you know. But you know. well, man, that's a good guy. Pra praise God. Mm -hmm. Look, he thinks he's <laughs> out. I hope you have a wreck. Mm. Yeah, that, yeah, that's how this stuff gets. It gets deep. Yeah. And we find ourselves sabotaging our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. with our words, with our tongue. Yeah. Mm. yeah, all that kind of stuff that keeps you immature, keeps you petty. We got some petty folks sometimes running around the church. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just saying that because you in this time, space, capsule, we call the flesh. Mm -hmm. And we have certain habits that we have not broken. We have certain sins that we're still coddling. Yeah, yeah he says, lay it aside. Take that stuff off. Because you cannot progress when you got these ball and chains strapped to your ankles, keeping you from moving forward. He says, uh, all evil speaking. Yeah. See, when you have that envy, you know, uh, subconsciously, you begin to develop a grudge toward people. Mm -hmm. you, you, you hate someone and can't really articulate why you don't like them. You have a grudge about people. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on and says, and all, it's 13, and all evil speaking. Mm -hmm. We call it slander. Yeah. Speaking against or defaming others. Bible says thou shalt not kill, does it? Mm -hmm. But we assassinate others' character mm -hmm. with our tongue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so notice, um, he said before, these are preventative things, right? Before you can really move toward spiritual maturity, before you can really become a fully functional and devoted follower of Jesus Christ, there are some things you must strip off. Mm -hmm. You must get rid of. See, all of these sins present uh, the negative aspect of Peter's exhortation. Peter wants you to grow. Mm -hmm. He wants you to mature. But first he has to deal from a negative component and say, you know what? You need to just get rid of some stuff. Mm -hmm. You need a clean house. Yeah. These must be put away before we can carry out the positive side of the practical steps towards spiritual maturity in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You can't, you know, put on the positive and tell you to get rid of the negative. Now we can say that they work hand in hand. Now, the more good you know, the more you're able to put off something. But it starts with the determination. This is a mindset. Because we're dealing with, you know, spiritual wickedness in high places. Mm -hmm. we're, we're dealing with spiritual warfare. We're dealing with the ingrained habits of worldliness, you know, uh, that you're supposed to left in the water grave of baptism. That's right. But there's not a practice. There's a practice that helps you to walk in the light. And this practice simply says, uh, do, uh, let me ask you a question. As we look at those five traits that were exposed in those three categories, the question, I don't go say amen, unless you can. Do any of these traits characterize you? Let's think about it. You have some, some envy toward people. You have some malice mm -hmm. toward some people. Mm -hmm. we, you see, we, we can't even, you know, we can't even come to the table with our garments soiled and filthy. Mm -hmm. Yes, we understand that Jesus allows us a place at the table. But this we're talking about today, we're talking about the practical. We're talking about how what God has worked in you. Mm -hmm. And if God has worked it in, you now need to work it out. Mm -hmm. And in order for you to work it out, you need to address some behaviors and some habits and some issues mm -hmm. that's hindering and stifling spiritual maturity. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. These are what prevent us from, from growing into the image of Jesus. And we all want to be like Jesus, right? We all want to mature. We all want to be fully functional. We all want to you know, be a mature Christian. Right? Yeah. But are you willing to put off those things? that you have become so comfortable with. Before you can even build a building, you must need have a what? Foundation, right? Mm -hmm. But before you can even build a foundation, you must first of all do what? You've got to clear the lot. Mm -hmm. You've got to get all the debris. If you want to build something in order to be prepared to build, you have to clear the lot. 
clear the way. And we're trying to build a building of, 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 of righteousness. And we're building on a foundation that has uh, dead bones and skeletons underneath. We have these sins that have never been removed. We just, you know, sprinkle a little righteousness over it. Like I'm, 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 baking, I'm baking something, and I, I sprinkle a little flour over it so that I can now smoothly roll the dough. Mm -mm. But there's some contaminants in the yeast, mm -hmm. uh, and it's leaven is in there, and it's going to destroy the whole cake or, the whole, or whatever it is you're baking. Mm -hmm. But we just sprinkle a little flour of righteousness over it so we can smoothly roll it on out and say, I show you I'm a good baker. Mm -hmm. And we brag about the cake. Or about whatever it is you make it. But on the inside, there's some stuff that needed to be removed before you start spreading all that flour. Mm -hmm. We call it God. We call it malice. We call it envy and hypocrisy and slander and evil speaking. Mm -hmm. He said, get rid of that stuff. And then you're able to build a great foundation. Mm -hmm. Notice, uh, that moves us to point number two. Uh, we've talked about uh, the 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 preparation for spiritual maturity. But now, as we made proper preparation, we want to talk about the positive practices of spiritual maturity. Notice what he said in verse number two. He said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. You see that? Mm -hmm. So not only does growth come uh, in laying aside the hindrances to spiritual maturity, but also growth comes uh, by uh, acquiring or putting on the attitudes and dispositions necessary for you uh, to grow. He said, desire what? The sincere milk of the word of God. Yes. The word of God is what's going to help you to grow. Mm -hmm. The word of God is got, got you saved, right? Mm -hmm. It gives you your blueprint. You know, we said the Bible is what? Um, I forget what they say. <laughs> Talking about from earth to heaven and all that kind of stuff. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Say it again. Basic instructions. Basic before instructions before leaving earth. Before leaving earth. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all got to go. Yeah. You better get some instructions yeah, yeah. before you get out of here. That's right. Yes, sir. And not only does growth come then by laying those aside those things, but also now that you lay those things aside, now it's had to put on what needs to be put on. And it's the attitude towards the thing. I want to talk about the, the, the desirability of the Word of God. So you have to desire. How many of us desire Jesus? How many of us desire His Word? You can't, you know, Jesus said, and He said it like this If you abide in me, and He didn't say, uh, and I abide in you. He said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, then you're going to produce much fruit. So you can't be fruitful. You see, it's one thing to even be in the word. But now the word must do what? Be in you. And so that's what this thing is all about. That word that I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. On your word I meditate day and night. The bottom line is the word has to be in you to bring forth the right transformation. You know, we dance around the word and we may have a few pet passages. But is the word in you? And is it bringing about the desired effect? If we're going to live a life affected by the word. Notice, uh, desirability of the word. In other words, we, it's because we love and desire God that we want to love and desire his word. As a matter of fact, it's his word. This is God breathed. Ah, uh, this is the product of God. The Holy Spirit moved uh, 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 and, and prompted the actual dictations uh, that have resulted in the Word of God. And so, I love God today. And therefore, I need to love me the Word of God. I need to show that love through my, not only digesting it, but allowing it to change me. See, we need some some, some, some vitamin B. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Vitamin D. Uh -oh. All that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
the stuff that comes from drinking milk. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. See, milk is the lifeblood of an infant. Without the milk, ah, uh, that infant is going to die. That's right. Yeah. So we have to have a, a desirability uh, for the word. And that desirability for the word, it reveals how much you desire God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom line, how much you desire the word is going to show how much you desire God. So notice he says, I, I want you to, as newborn babes, he used the word crave, desire, or crave. This holy craving for God cultivates uh, the essential for holy living. Mm-hmm. He says, as newborn infants who desperately depend on the mother's milk. That's how you ought to crave the word of God. Okay, he uses this idea of craving here. And he uses a newborn infant who's totally dependent on the mother's breast. Who is totally uh, nourished by the mother's milk. Notice he says, he says, desire, uh, like a newborn baby, desire the sincere milk. Wait a minute. The sincere milk of the word. The reason, I mean, the, the fact that he said the sincere milk of the word suggests that there are some nourishment, there's some civil acting, and all that kind of stuff going around. Mm-hmm. Contaminate. Right now, babies can't drink it, they go to some other country to get milk shipped in. Mm-hmm. All that formula stuff. Mm-hmm. He said desire the sincere milk of the word. That idea of sincere simply means without wax. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what does that mean? Without wax. In other words, in those ancient times, they would make pottery, sell it in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. And off times when those pots would break mm-hmm. or crack or have a defect, mm-hmm. they would get wax and they would fill in the crack. Mm-hmm. And once they got the crack filled in, you know what they would do? They would paint over it. And then sell it, just like it's it had never been broken. Mm-hmm. So he says, desire the sincere milk, the pure yeah. milk, pure. free from the wax. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, a, there's a lot of doctrine floating around today uh, that has a lot of cracks in it, mm-hmm. and we have, and man has put a lot of wax over it, mm-hmm. and 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 and, and, and pepped it off as a genuine article. He said, I want you to crave the sincere or the pure milk of the word uh, because there is much to gain by having this kind of pure milk. Mm-hmm. Turn, turn to the Bible, the Bible to uh, 2 Timothy. Now, we all know this by heart, but I think sometimes we just want to read something uh, just for emphasis sake. Notice the Bible in 2 Timothy. Chapter 3. We, we, we know this passage. I've been trying not to quote it for all, pretty much all day. It says, I'll be first to this one. Um, notice what it says. It says, all scripture. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Oh, the word of God. In all scripture is given by God. That's right. He uses the word by the inspiration mm-hmm. of God. Mm-hmm. And is profitable. Mm-hmm. Okay? And that's what I want to get. And is profitable uh, for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Mm-hmm. That the man of God may be perfect. As Brother Goodlow would say, and uh, thoroughly furnished yeah. unto all good works I've done. Yeah. I used to love to hear him say that. Yeah. The point is, and I, I just simply change it by saying becoming fully functional and devoted follower of Christ. We need to be fat. In other words, 
faithful, available, and teachable. Mm -hmm. But notice, he says the profitability of the word. It's profitable for, for doctrine or for teaching. It shows you where to walk. You know, it shows you how to walk. Mm -hmm. If you want to get on a path of right, you want to be a Christian, the Bible will show you what you need to do to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. Point blank, period. So not only does it give you, uh, and it's profitable for, for doctrine, to show you where to walk, but also for reproof. That's what it means to knock off the feet. See, sometimes you need to be knocked off. In other words, show us how far off we are. See, if you are far off, the word of God will not only, it can put you on the right path, but it can keep you on the right path. Mm -hmm. right. It can show you just where you strayed uh -huh. from the truth. That's right. uh, for uh, correction. That's where and how to get back on the right track. Mm -hmm. You know, the so one thing to be, see, sometimes we're just back and forth, on and off. Yeah. Back and forth. Yeah. In and out. In and out of the church, in and out of the word of God, mm -hmm. in and out of trouble, in and out of mess, mm -hmm. back and forth. Amen. Can't get rooted in the ground because you're not here long enough to really get settled. Mm -hmm. And if you are here, your commitment ain't here. Mm -hmm. You can be here in body, but your commitment is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, for reproof and for correction, in other words, where and how to get back on the right track. For instruction in righteousness. That's how to keep on the right track. In other words, if you want to walk the path of righteousness, the Word of God tells you how you want to walk and guide your steps and regulate your path and all that kind of thing. And as a result, you stay on the path of righteousness. Righteousness simply means doing that what is right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Being in the right relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And the Word of God helps me to maintain my course. Mm -hmm. See, the progressive result uh, that uh, we need is simply this. We need to grow. He said, notice, in respect to what? In respect to your self. Notice what he says in verse number. Go back to my text. He says, as newborn braves desire to sit sick of the word, okay, that ye may grow thereby. Thereby what? In respect to your salvation, in respect to the fact that you, in chapter 1, he told you everything you needed to do to be saved. And now in chapter 2, he begins to say, now that you are saved, this is how you stay saved. This is how you stay on the straight and narrow path. The word of God gives me that. Now that it's given to, now it's on you to take up and to apply it. And when you do, we have a church that cannot be stopped. You know, we say, Satan is going to turn your kingdom down and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm a hard fighting soldier. Well, how do we get equipped to be effective in battle? The word of God. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I challenge and encourage all of us not only to just have the Bible, but then give yourself to the Bible. That's right. That's right. You know, begin to immerse yourself in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. with, the, with, with the intent. Now here's, here's the kicker right here. I'm not just talking about acquiring of data. We must first approach the Word of God with this attitude. An attitude that says, Speak, Lord, your servant hears. An attitude that says, command the Lord, and I will obey. Yeah. The Bible says, Jesus said, why well, call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? That's right. Mm -hmm. Many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, have we not did anything? Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we not done many wonderful works? And I will say, I never knew you. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so the word of God is important. But the word of God must have an effect on you. Mm -hmm. As I close. As I close. As we look at the progressive growth. You see, Jesus had progressive growth. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, but that he that he grew in favor with in stature mm -hmm. and in favor with God and man. Mm -hmm. See, when you are immersed in the word, you're going to have favor with God. And because it has changed your disposition, it has, you know, sweetened your disposition, you, will, you have favor with man as well because you're a do-right kind of person. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a do-right kind of person. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a person who uh, do, does unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mm -hmm. you, be kind of, you become the kind of person who uh, is willing uh, to 
yield right away to other folk. You're one who able to stand for righteousness. Mm -hmm. Don't give in to a lot of craziness. Right. One who will not compromise your standards. Mm -hmm. People wouldn't, they may not like you, but they show enough, show enough to respect you. Mm -hmm. And therefore they respect God. They're going to respect you, the man of God, or the woman of God. Now, let me get this to you. So Peter is not only contrasting new people. He's not, let me tell you, tell you what he's not doing. Because we fall in this trap. Peter is not contrasting uh, newborn babes with mature Christians here. Let's understand that. He's not making a contrast between newborn babes and mature Christians. Go over there to Hebrews, you know, 5, 12 through 14, you'll see that. But in this passage, why he's not making a contrast between the two. He is simply saying all Christians, every last one of us, ought to have this kind of attitude, an attitude of a newborn baby. Okay? He's not trying to hierarchy, do some hierarchy. Some of you Christians over here, old babies, and some of you over too. No, he's not talking about none of that. That every last one of us need to have the attitude of a newborn baby when we approach the world, craving the sense of look of the world that we can grow thereby. Okay? Because it leads to profound proof of spiritual maturity. See, when you mature in Christ, you don't have to run around talking about I'm a tool. Mm. You know, you know, uh, have pity on the weaker brethren and all that kind of stuff. Mm. <laughs> no, no, no. Your actions speak louder than your words. That's right. See, when you're a tool in Christ, you don't have to beat all your chest. I'm a tool. No. Uh, the evidence speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. Notice he said, one easy little sentence. He said, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Okay? The, 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 the profound proof of spiritual maturity. The more I get, the more I want it. The man mindset here. You see in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number what, 6? Yeah. He says, Blessed are those who do what? Who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's right. The more I get, the more I want. Mm -hmm. Don't just give me a couple of water. I want the whole picture of water. <laughs> Don't give me a slice of bread. I want the whole earth. The more of God I get, the more I want. The more of his word I get, the more I want. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of attitude, that kind of mindset, because I'm ready to do whatever he wants me to do. Mm -hmm. And no, I don't have to know exactly what God wants me to do before I take the first step of faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when God said, who should I send? Who should go for us? In Isaiah chapter 6, uh, uh, Isaiah said what? He said, here am I. Send me. That's right. And then as he begins it all, oh, by the way, God, where do you want me to go? Yeah. He didn't know where God wanted him to go, but he had a mindset. That wherever you lead our Father, wherever you send me, I will go. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's what we, that's the, our, the, the attitude that we must possess. Amen. Yeah, yeah. And notice this. <laughs> uh, notice in the King James it says, if uh, so you have tasted. Um, other versions say, since you have tasted. See, he's not asking a question by saying if. He is stating a condition, a fact. Yes, you have tasted that he's good. Mm -hmm. Since you have, the fact that you have to go back to chapter one. The whole chapter one talks about the experience of the goodness of God mm -hmm. in your redemption, in your conversion, in your salvation. He said, now do all this stuff because you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Mm -hmm. Well, when was he gracious in your salvation? Mm -hmm. What was he gracious in your conversion? When you became a Christian, that was the grace of God. So you've taken, you, let me use another word, you have experienced. You have experienced the goodness of God. You have experienced the graciousness of God. He displayed that when Jesus died on the cross. He dis displayed it when, 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 when on, on, on Pentecost. Uh, God ushered in a new order and allowed you to be saved. The graciousness of God. And so therefore he says, since you have tasted or experienced the kindness of the Lord. So when you obey the gospel, when you are converted, you experience the goodness of God. Therefore, we should now possess a great hunger to experience what comes next. God has done all this for you. And you're excited about what God has accomplished in your life thus far. You ought to wake up with a sense of anticipation. I'm excited about what he's done. And even as I go through the struggles on this time side of life in my today, 
I'm still excited about what's going to happen today because I have a hopeful expectation of what's going to culminate in my tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I know God is good. I've tasted that he is good. And since I've tasted he's good in my redemption, I now know that he's going to do some great things with me now. Mm -hmm. So when I was an enemy, he loved me. How much more does he love you because you are his child? Mm -hmm. Come on now. Amen. How much more does he love you? Mm -hmm. How much more should you be eager to be affected by his word so you can be effective in administering that word to us? Amen. When we get there, uh, we're on the road uh, to reach the high enough to call God. Mm -hmm. We're on our path. I know where God has brought me from. And now I eagerly await what he has in store for me. That's right. And all those who wish to experience mm -hmm. him more and more. Mm -hmm. All those who wish to experience him, not only in salvation, but now what is he going to do with me now that I am a Christian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got work to do. But God said, first of all, I want you to be succumb and transformed. <laughs> That's a lifelong process. We understand that. But first of all, let's begin by clearing the lot. Let's read it. Don't, don't start building works of righteousness on a foundation of wickedness, mm -hmm. of malice and God and enemy. Let's clear the lot. Let's strip some stuff away so we can build something that's going to last. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you're here today, if you're not a member of the body of Christ, understand that God loves you. And this message is for you. He wants you to experience his goodness by uh, being converted. By being buried in the water of every baptism, but it is preceded by simply saying, Yeah, I believe that God loves me. I also believe that I've done some awesome things against him. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry about that. I want to I want to make amends. I want to I want to put that stuff away. I want to repent of all that stuff. I want to strip that away. I, I want to acknowledge not only his love for me, but acknowledge that he is the Lord. And I want to submit to his lordship. I'm ready, I have decided to follow Jesus. Because I know he is Lord. And I want to now be buried in the water of grave of baptism for the remission of sin. See, the Bible says you were baptized into Christ. Right? And you're sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For many of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so therefore we understand what we must do to be saved. And then desire to send the Savior to the Word that you may grow thereby. Think about that. As we stand and think of all the encouragement, we invite you to respond.